Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. One thing before we start the show. I want to let you know about a special interview you'll hear at the end of this episode. It's with the host of a brand new podcast called Art Architects, the architects of art. The cool thing is this show is hosted by Director X and Taj Critchlow, two of the biggest music video directors on the planet. These guys are responsible for game-changing videos from artists like Drake and Coldplay and Kendrick Lamar and so many more. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. I sure did. That's coming up at the end of this episode. All right, let's get on with things. 50 years ago, there was no such thing as the Canadian music industry. Well, at least not compared to the U.S. or the U.K. Yeah, we had bands who played gigs and recorded singles and albums. But there wasn't much of an infrastructure to support a domestic scene. Too few recording studios, a lack of experienced promoters and managers and producers. There was a tiny collection of domestic record labels. And there was a steady drain of talent to the United States. If you really wanted to make it big... You had to leave the country. All that's pretty discouraging, isn't it? And Canadian radio stations were not helping. There was a perception that audiences did not want to hear much of this domestic music because, uh, well, it wasn't very good. It was inferior to all the music coming from America and England. And this contributed to the overall opinion with the general public that Canadian music just wasn't worth anyone's time. At the same time, though, it didn't seem right that our musical culture and our music scenes, such as they were, were being overwhelmed by foreign powers. Canadian artists were getting smothered in the crib, so something needed to be done. And five decades ago, something was done on January 18th, 1971. It was difficult, expensive, and in some quarters, wildly unpopular. But it turned Canada into a global musical powerhouse, eventually. This is 50 Years of CanCon. This is the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Okay, Bill, let's uh, walk it through. Okay. Oh, Canada, our home and... What are you doing? Uh, with what? No, uh, with the words. It sounds... You're speaking it. I'm singing it. It's how I sing. Just, uh, like, oh... Oh, Canada. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and we're going through the story of how Canada turned from a musical backwater into the envy of much of the world when it comes to both the domestic music industry and a country that can export its music to the rest of the world. Depending on the year, we are either the fifth or sixth largest music market in the world. We're always scrapping out with Australia. Ahead of us is the U.S., Japan, the U.K., Germany, and France, all of which have larger populations than us. A big part of the reason we've done so well is because of the Canadian content regulations that were put into place over 50 years ago, January 18th, 1971 to be exact. On that date, it became the law that 30% of all the music heard on Canadian radio had to come from Canadian artists. That led to, well, hang on here, I'm, I'm getting way ahead of things, so we, we really need to go back to the beginning. Like I said earlier, there wasn't much of a Canadian music industry in the 50s and 60s. Anyone who wanted to make it big left for the U.S. Our best and brightest bailed. Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, Leonard Cohen, Paul Anka, and many others all left for America. And Canadians didn't do much to help the situation, nor did Canadian radio. Here's an example. In January 1965, a group called Chad Allen and the Expressions recorded a cover of a song called Shaken All Over. They were signed to Quality Records, a Canadian label which believed the song was a hit. The problem was that Quality Records knew that they'd never get this song on Canadian radio because there was such a bias against Canadian songs. The overwhelming opinion was that the only Canadian songs worth adding to a playlist were those who had proved themselves by being a big hit in the U.S. first. So Quality came up with a plan 
they shipped seven inch singles to radio stations all across Canada with the fiction that this was a hot new British group. It kind of did sound British, you know, sort of invasion y. And British music was cool, but quality purposely left the name of the group off the record. All it said was, guess who? With a question mark. The ruse worked, and Shaken All Over was added to playlists across the country. It was only a few months later, somewhere around the middle of March of 1965, that radio stations realized that they'd been tricked into playing a Canadian band. By early 1966, and after a few lineup changes, Chad Allen and the expressions became, yes, the guess who. The scam was covered by a new Canadian industry publication called RPM, which was founded in Toronto by Walt Gray Alice in 1964, a little less than a year before the guess who did their little trick. RPM stood for Records, Promotions, Music, and tracked what was going on in Canada when it came to radio and music. One of the ways they did that was to publish Canadian music charts, something that no one had bothered to do at the time. But the big stations did not appreciate this. In fact, they tossed copies of RPM sent to them straight into the garbage. All they wanted was the big American hits. I mean, who cares about inferior Canadian crap? But Walt and his partner, Stan Cleese, kept at it. And smaller stations outside of the major markets started paying attention to the RPM charts. This proved to Stan and to Walt that there was interest in Canadian music and something had to be done to promote it. Stan started lobbying everyone he met about his idea of creating rules that would open up space for Canadian acts on Canadian radio. He talked to artists and managers and producers and record labels and radio stations, and most importantly, politicians. All this happened at a very important time in Canadian history. In 1967, the country turned 100 years old. A new flag had just been adopted, and Montreal hosted the world with Expo 67. A new sense of cultural pride had taken hold. There was this new nationalism in the country, the idea that Canada had come of age and was mature enough to take its place on the world stage. We weren't just some big cold country in the attic of North America anymore. We were to be taken seriously. From 1967 forward, doing and celebrating Canadian things became extremely popular, and that extended to music. Eventually, discussions made it to the Canadian Radio, Television, and Communications Commission, which was headed up by a guy named Pierre Junot. Here was the issue. The Canadian music industry, such that it was, was mostly a foreign-owned or foreign-controlled thing. Globally speaking, we were this musical backwater. Yes, there was a domestic sector, but it was tiny, and as we saw with the Guess Who example, largely ignored. Everything in the country was basically branch offices of big U.S. labels. Of them, only capital seemed to be interested in any kind of Canadian talent. And how could a Canadian music industry compete with the United States? The largest and most powerful exporter of culture is right on our border. How do we maintain any kind of distinct and separate cultural identity? And when it comes to music, how could Canada possibly create its own Beatles or Bob Dylan or Rolling Stones if there was no concerted, concentrated, unified effort designed to make that happen? After much public consultation, the CRTC agreed to establish the Canadian Content Rules, otherwise known as CanCon, which stipulated that from January 18, 1971 forward, a non-negotiable percentage of every AM radio station's playlist had to be dedicated to music of Canadian origin. And that number was 30%. Three out of every 10 songs on the radio in this country had to be Canadian. We'll pick up the story after we listen to some CanCon. At first, radio stations hated the idea of this CanCon quota. Some ignored them completely, which they were told by the CRTC that this jeopardized their broadcasting licenses. So they got into line pretty quickly. Others got creative. To get around the rules, some stations created something known as Beaver Hours. They'd take a bunch of Canadian songs, edit them down to their barest essence, let's say 90 seconds to two minutes, and play them all between 11 and midnight. If you could get 20 or more Canadian songs in that one hour, that went a long way to fulfilling the daily 30% quota, meaning that most of the day was still filled with international acts. That loophole was eventually filled with new rules that prevented stations from creating these Canadian music dumping grounds. All right, back up a sec. 
1964, just as RPM magazine was starting out, Walt Grealis believed that Canadian music needed its own awards program. It began as the RPM Awards, which you might guess. It was really just an annual column in the magazine, augmented by a small wine and cheese party. Voting cards were sent out to subscribers, who were asked to fill them in and send them back. But in 1970, they became known as the Gold Leaf Awards, which was envisioned as an annual event honoring achievements in the Canadian music industry. The first event was held on February 23, 1970 in Toronto, and 250 people showed up to snack on sandwiches and booze that ran out after 20 minutes. A year later, the Gold Leaf Awards morphed into the Juno Awards. Juno, taken from Pierre Junot, the head of the CRTC, when the CanCon rules were created. The first Juno Awards took place on February 22, 1971. More CanCon history after more CanCon. The CanCon rules were an obvious cultural strategy, how to foster and promote Canadian music to Canadians. But the rules were also an industrial strategy. By creating this artificial demand for Canadian music, by forcing radio stations to play it, an entire infrastructure was required. That meant recording studios, producers, engineers, promoters, agents, and record labels to make everything happen. Within a year of the CanCon rules going into effect, not only had the major international labels started to play ball, but a whole bunch of new Canadian-based labels started to appear. There was GRT, Attic, True North, Aquarius, Nimbus 9, Axe, and Daffodil. That's just a few of them. Some of them still exist today. And all of them started signing and promoting Canadian artists, which were then played, by law, on Canadian radio. It was ugly at first. If you played a typical Canadian record from, let's say, 1971, side by side with a foreign record of the day, you could tell which was which. The Canadian record probably sounded substandard, amateurish, and not very good. But to maintain that 30% quota, you had to dig pretty deep into the barrel. But it was the law. And for a while, Canadian meant bad. Most Canadian radio stations had separate CanCon sections in their music libraries, it was very segregated, reminding people that these records had a special lower caste designation. It was a necessary evil. AM radio had its 30% content requirement, and in 1975, FM radio fell under the same rules. And although opposition from radio continued, and the general public was largely meh about Canadian acts, the initiatives started to bear fruit. More Canadian radio exposure began to turn into increased popularity for Canadian-made music. This meant more record sales. More record sales meant more investment in the infrastructure of the music industry. Slowly, very slowly, a virtuous circle began to develop. Domestic acts began to rack up impressive sales. More people started coming to shows. And request lines started to ring, with listeners asking for Canadian songs from April Wine and Prism and Lighthouse and Triumph and Rush and Chilliwack and others. And the new infrastructure allowed for subcultures to develop and release their own records. This could very well be the first ever Canadian punk rock record. It was released in May 1977. It's the Diodes and Red Rubber Ball. The Diodes with Red Rubber Ball, which is actually a cover of a 1967 song by an American band called The Circle, the group who opened for the Beatles on their last North American tour, and the song was co-written by some young folky named Paul Simon. I should mention that there is another candidate for the first ever Canadian punk record. That would be Screaming Fist by the Vile Tones. It also came out in May 1977, but just as we're unclear about the actual release date of that first Diodes record, we're not sure on which day Screaming Fist came out. Anyway, much to the surprise of critics coast to coast, the new CanCon rules worked when it came to developing not just Canadian talent, but a Canadian industry that just kept getting stronger. We'll pick up things there in a moment. This program marks 50 years of CanCon, Canadian content, rules that came into effect on January 18, 1971, and pushed Canada to creating a powerful and profitable music industry. One thing that we haven't discussed yet is how do you determine the Canadianness of a song? 
Well, for this, we have to go back to Stan Cleese, who developed what became known as the Maple System. If you look at any physical product you have, CD, vinyl, cassette, whatever, and it's from a Canadian artist, you'll see a little pie-shaped chart somewhere in the liner notes or on the medium itself. It's divided into four quadrants with the letters M, A, P, and L. These letters help identify the Canadianness of the recording. The M stands for music. If it appears in the circle, that means the music of that recording was composed entirely by a Canadian. The A stands for artist. If you see an A, it means that the music or the singing is performed principally by a Canadian. P is a bit tricky. If you see a P, it means that the recording was made entirely in a Canadian studio, or in the case of a live recording, it means that it was performed entirely and broadcast live in Canada. And finally, there's L. If one of those appears, that means a Canadian wrote the lyrics. In order for a song to qualify as genuine, government-approved, legitimate Canadian content, it has to fulfill at least two of those four criteria. Straightforward, right? Well, not really, because sometimes we end up with some very odd situations. Take this song, for example. The music was written by Burton Cummings and Randy Bachman. That's good for an M. The lyrics were written by Burton Cummings. That's good for an L. So it's two parts CanCon, which is the minimum, and therefore is a Canadian song. But the last time I looked, Lenny Kravitz was born in New York City and is a resident of the United States and the Bahamas. And this was recorded in a studio that wasn't in Canada. Yet it qualifies as CanCon. Strange, right? But such is bureaucracy. It also explains why this song was a big Canadian hit. A famous international artist playing a Canadian classic? What's not the love? Play it! Lenny Kravitz, an honorary Canadian, at least as far as that song and our CanCon rules are concerned. Let me give you another example. Eddie Vedder's Hard Sun was from the Into the Wild soundtrack and continues to be heard regularly on Canadian radio and almost nowhere else. Why? Because it's another cover of a Canadian song. When Sean Penn was directing the movie, he chanced upon an out-of-print album by an Ontario musician who went by the name of Indio. In 1989, Indio, whose real name is Gordon Peterson, by the way, released an album entitled Big Harvest, and Hard Sun became a single and a top 10 hit. And then Indio disappeared. But when Eddie covered it in 2007, Canadian radio jumped all over it and continues to play it even today because it's officially a Canadian song. Music and lyrics by Gordon Peterson. It doesn't matter that Eddie Vedder, originally from Evanston, Illinois, is performing. It is CanCon. And you would think that Gordon Peterson would be thrilled that a song from his one and only out-of-print album would be picked up by one of the most famous singers in the world. Uh, no. In 2009, he actually sued Eddie and Universal Music for covering his song without his permission and altering the words slightly. The case was ultimately settled, but... Here's another example of the weirdness that comes with our CanCon system. For years, the biggest selling single in the entire world was Everything I Do, I Do It For You from Brian Adams. More than 8 million copies of the single were sold worldwide. Number one in almost two dozen countries. It won a Grammy. It was nominated for an Academy Award. Gigantic hit. And no one will argue that Brian Adams isn't about as Canadian as you can get. Born in Kingston, Ontario, proud resident of Vancouver, his father was a member of the Canadian Army. He was a UN peacekeeper and diplomat with assignments in Portugal and Vienna. Brian later became known as an acclaimed photographer, taking a portrait of the Queen that was later used on a Canadian stamp. And he loves hockey. I mean, seriously, how can you get any more Canadian than that? Yet his song, Everything I Do, I Do It For You, was not Canadian. Here's why. Now, there is no question that Brian sang the song. That's, that's a given. That qualifies the song for the A, that one part CanCon. But when it comes to music and lyrics, we have a problem. There were two collaborators on the song. Producer Jeff Mutt Lang, the ex-Mr. Shania Twain, by the way, and a citizen of England, and Michael Kamen, an American composer. No matter how you add up all the fractional contributions, it was determined that the song was no more than 1.5 parts CanCon, 
half a bureaucratic point below being officially Canadian. So that meant radio stations could not get credit for playing a Brian Adams song as part of their daily and weekly quota of Canadian content. Just dumb. However, I should point out that this rule has since been changed to allow for more leniency when it comes to collaborations involving non-Canadians. Some of us radio people call this the Brian Adams rule. Even today, when certain songs are released, the label and sometimes radio stations appeal to the CRTC for a ruling on if a particular song qualifies of CanCon if it seems to be a little bit too close to the line. You can't assume a song's CanCon-ness because if you do and you put it on your playlist, you run the risk of not making your weekly Canadian CanCon quota. And believe me, not making your quota is a firing offense. There is nothing in Canadian radio more serious than screwing up your CanCon numbers. Nothing. Radio stations have lost their licenses because they did not make their CanCon numbers. Here's an example of something super close to the CanCon line. Dallas Green of Alexis on Fire and City in Color collaborated on a 2014 album called You and Me with Pink. He's Canadian. She's American. Lots of the work was done by exchanging files online from their respective home studios. Uh, You begin to see why a ruling was needed. In the end, the album did get its CanCon certification as the CRTC ruled that one lead singer was enough for a full artist, a full A, as far as the Maple system went. That was enough to make the album qualify. But this came retroactively. The album was already out before the ruling came down. Then there's Pop Evil. They're a band from Michigan. The founder of this band is Lee Kelly. He is Canadian and has a hand in writing all the songs. But everyone else in the band is American. So how Canadian is a Pop Evil song. It was so close that this required a ruling by the CRTC. Like I said, better safe than sorry. You do not want to screw up your CanCon numbers. Oh, and by the way, this is CanCon. Government says so. Cause here I come, here I come, yeah! Still more on 50 Years of CanCon coming up. A few more things before we finish up this program looking at 50 years of CanCon. Like I said earlier, it was rough going in the 70s and 80s when it came to finding plenty of quality Canadian music. It just wasn't there. The whole country needed time to develop. By the time we got to the 1980s, things really began to improve. Canadian artists were not only on the radio, they were selling significant numbers of records. They were playing larger and larger venues across the country, and some of them were even having serious international success. One of the most important moves was the introduction of FACTOR in 1982. This stands for Foundation to Assist Canadian Talent on Records. Radio stations are required to contribute funds to FACTOR, which then distributes the money to artists who pass the juries who judge whether or not this music is worth funding. This money can be used for recording and touring and their general development as artists. FACTOR now distributes millions of dollars every year. When foreign artists find out that Canadian artists have access to such a fund, they just can't believe it. Really? We should move here. The appearance of Much Music in 1984 was a big part of CanCon history. For the first time, a kid in St. John's, Newfoundland could experience the same music as a kid in Whitehorse at the same time. To help create a domestic music video industry, VideoFact was created. Both Factor and VideoFact went a long way when it came to artist development in this country. One of the biggest stories of the 1980s was the rise of the Tragically Hip, starting in about 1987. Within a few years, they had become the foundation of what some call the Can Rock Revolution, a period where Generation X found its musical nationalism and started demanding more Canadian music. Okay, some were nationalistic about the music, but many others liked it because it was good. There was a massive explosion in the popularity of Canadian bands in the 90s, Matt Good, The Tea Party, Our Lady Peace, I'm Mother Earth, Bare Naked Ladies, Pursuit of Happiness, Sloan, The Watchman, Moist, The Headstones, Econoline Crush, Limb Lifter, Biff Naked, Rio Statics, and so many more. They sold records by the tens of thousands and the hundreds of thousands. Some, like The Hip and Our Lady Peace, even sold records by the millions just in Canada. So, after 20 years of development and nurturing, Canadian music had come of age. 
There were Canadian heavy festivals like Edgefest, Somersault, and another roadside attraction, to name just three. And Canadian artists who came up through the system, Linus Morissette, Sarah McLachlan, Shania Twain, Celine Dion, became international megastars. This continued into the 2000s. Nickelback's How You Remind Me became the most played song on American radio between 2001 and 2009. We have Michael Bublé and Justin Bieber and Drake and Shawn Mendes and The Weeknd. The music was so solid by the end of the 90s that when CanCon requirements were raised from 30 to 35 percent on January 3rd, 1999, almost nobody noticed. Since 2000, most new radio station applications have promised a quota of 40 percent. No one would make such a pledge if they didn't think such a mix of music would work with the audience. Before we wrap things up, we need to ask some hard questions. First, given that our CanCon strategy has been so successful and that Canada has established its powerhouse reputation both domestically and on the world stage, do we need CanCon regulations anymore? Does Canadian music still need protecting? This is a very dangerous question because it's loaded with all kinds of political, economic, and cultural bombs. Let's tiptoe through everything, beginning with those who believe that CanCon rules are more important than ever. They will argue the following. Number one, how else can artists be assured of public exposure to their fellow Canadians? The last time anyone checked, the U.S. is still next door and exporting more culture than ever thanks to streaming music platforms and all of them are foreign-based and foreign-owned. Number two, speaking of which, streaming services put nothing back into the system. They just siphon money out of the country without investing anything back into Canada. CanCon is a bulwark against that. Number three, other countries have domestic music quotas for radio. France, Australia, New Zealand, Mexico, South Africa, Nigeria, Jamaica, Venezuela, Israel, the Philippines. They all realize that homegrown content needs to be protected and promoted lest it be swamped by foreign material. Number four, elimination of CanCon would inevitably mean the loss of jobs. There are all these organizations whose very existence is the result of CanCon. You think they're all going to voluntarily disappear? Number five, Canadians love Canadian music. Why would you deny them something they love? Number six, the coronavirus pandemic decimated the business. You want to change things now? Don't think so. And number seven, CanCon is working. If it ain't broke, why would you want to tinker with it? Now let's look at the other side. Number one, some artists say that the cream will inevitably rise to the top. If the music is good, it will probably be discovered and get heard. If you need a quota to help make it, well, then you're probably not good enough. This is the attitude in America where there's a lot of opposition to the kind of support Canada and other countries give to artists. Number two, CanCon can actually hurt an act's chances of making it big internationally. People, especially in the U.S. industry, look at big Canadian songs and big Canadian acts and say, well, of course they were hits. Of course they were stars. They were legislated to be that way. And number three, there's this argument, although it doesn't hold as much water as when people were still getting most of their music from CDs. If the natural level of Canadian music sales is 15% or 25% in record stores, Shouldn't that be the level of CanCon on the radio? Then we need to pivot. Where do we go from here? Radio stations point out that they're burdened with CanCon regulations that new tech doesn't have to worry about. The internet is, as of yet, unregulated. There's no such thing as CanCon requirements for Spotify or Apple Music or any of the others. And unlike Canadian radio, streaming services are not required to give back by putting money into Canadian culture. There was a proposal around the turn of the century that would see overall CanCon levels reduced from 35% to 25% in exchange for radio stations promising to play more new, emerging, and untested artists. That, the thinking went, would incentivize Canadian radio to take more chances with music. Well, that didn't fly. And we need to expand our vision beyond radio stations that play new music. It's tough for classic rock, classic hits, and oldie stations to deal with any increases in CanCon. After all, the last time I looked, no one is making more classic rock these days. And all that means, if you increase the quotas, is that the old standbys, Rush, Guess Who, BTO, Neil Young, Tragically Hip, get their songs played over and over and over again just to fill those quotas. Oh, sure, the stations could go back and play other acts from the classic rock era, 
But remember what I said about all the bad music that was being made back then? The reason nobody is playing those songs now is because they have not aged well. No one wants to hear them. No one cares. Do we want to go back to playing those songs just to fill quotas? Meanwhile, those acts I just talked about love the radio airplay royalties they're getting. And with their back catalog selling less and less, and with little uptake in the streaming world, you think they're going to go along with any kind of reduction in CanCon? No. What do we do about international trade deals? Free trade arrangements often bring up the concept of domestic quotas, including those that govern culture, like music and CanCon. Tricky questions. Meanwhile, domestic artists continue to benefit from our rules and regulations. And ultimately, that means we as music fans do too. Let me leave you with some arcade fire. Several members of the group are American-born, but because they are landed immigrants, they benefit from the rights and privileges accorded to them by CanCon. Arcade Fire is a Canadian group. And there is a, well, maybe not so brief history of Canadian content. I hope this tutorial has made things a little more clear when it comes to why things are the way they are when you tune into a Canadian radio station. I tried to explain how the Canadian music scene became so strong, and I left you with some important questions about what happens with CanCon going forward. This is an evolving story. We'll keep tabs on it. Podcasts for this program are available wherever you get podcasts. Just download and go. We can meet up on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. There's my website, which is updated every day, a journal of musicalthings.com. And that's where you'll find playlists for each episode, too. And get the daily newsletter so you don't miss anything. Tactical Productions by Rob Johnston. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Before we leave today's Ongoing History of New Music podcast, uh, I want you to know that we're part of a network called Curious Cast. And Curious Cast has a lot of podcasts available on its network. And one of the new ones is called Art Cotex. And I have two of the hosts of Art Cotex with me here. Uh, we have Taj Krishlow and Director X. And we want to give you a bit of a, an introduction to what this new podcast is all about. So who wants to go first? and explain exactly what you guys will be doing. And obviously, here's a hint, if you're at the end of this podcast, my podcast, Chance Start has something to do with music. So our show is pretty much about, it's in the world of music. It's pretty much us sitting down with uh, storytellers that come from music videos. Uh, I feel like we live in a world where we don't give these, these amazing creative uh, artists uh, the flowers they deserve. They create some of the most uh, impactful uh, content on the planet that gets a lot of eyeballs on it. And coming from the world of music video, being in the business for over 20 years, we felt it was necessary to create a show like Architects to sit down and hear their stories, their come ups, their journey, their process of creating some of the most iconic music videos, films, and content on the planet. Now, you guys have been deeply involved in this world for, like you say, a long time. Who have you worked with? I've directed videos for Alicia Keys, Puff Daddy, Cisco, uh, uh, Destiny's Child, Drake, Justin Bieber, Two Chains, Rosalia, Iggy Azalea, Sean Paul, Beanie Man, um, Ariana Grande. Uh, well, you know. Okay, uh, now now you're just bragging. <laughs> <laughs> Corn, John Mayer, the list goes on. Like we, this has literally been um, a crazy journey. And and I would say X is the goat because as long as he's been doing it, like like late '90s to now, it's still relevant. You know, like we broke our our production company fella with uh, this music video for uh, for DJ Khaled, Drake, and Bieber called Pop Star. So it's 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 been a crazy journey. And um, and we're two kids from Brampton, Ontario that uh, went out to, you know, make art that broke out to the world. And now we're using our podcast as another form of storytelling, but through an audio uh, medium. Okay. 
how are you going to make that transition? You've been telling stories through video. Now it's going to be only audio. So uh, you're going to have to change your style a little bit, I guess. I mean, we're talking to the creator, so it's a different kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, the, the story is the story of the maker. So it's not conceptualizing music and visuals to it. It's talking like the last, the first podcast, the debut of our, of the show was with Dave Myers. Um, another guy that's been in the game for a long, long time. And just talking about that, the philosophy behind his approach to art, the work he's done. And, you know, as well, digging into some of the larger world issues out there. Like we have a whole talk about black lives matter. Uh, on that podcast and being a white director and his perspective coming up in a black music uh, world. So it's just a, it's a little different than what we're used to doing. Without any spoilers, give me the kind of stories that you'll be telling. Give me an example of a story. I guess the examples is pretty much their come up. Um, what they, what gravity, what, what drew them in to get into this world of uh, filmmaking, um, their influences, um, their highs, their lows, and pretty much their breakthrough moment. And, and a lot of times to your point, um, Alan, like when you watch a music video, you're just seeing the end result, but you don't see what, what went into to make that product. And, and that, that piece of art as far as the storyboards and the, the art direction and sitting down with your head department and the collaboration. So it's pretty much we're, we're, we're giving them that kind of, you know, close set behind experience where you get to see the process of how uh, we get to the finish line. Right. I've, I've always, I've often watched music videos and wondered where the hell did this come from? What kind of <laughs> headspace do you have to be in to come up with these images, these storylines, these, you know, things. Uh, and, and I have no idea. Yeah, it's it's and that's the point of the show. Like, look, we're probably like around the same age. Like I came up I came up in the 80s era where that's what made me fall in love with music videos. Right. The MTV much music era watching videos by like Madonna and Peter Gabriel and like Phil Collins and, and Michael Jackson and uh, uh, and Aerosmith. And I was always fascinated by music videos and the storytelling and the dancing and the style and all that stuff. And that's what got, that's what made us fall in love with the art. So imagine if you could go back in the days and sit down with Duran Duran and talk about the hungry, like a wolf video, like what the hell compelled you guys to be in this jungle and, and, and just going through this crazy, crazy story and sitting down with like the best of the best and hearing their, the stories of the directors working with Madonna and working with the stones. And that's the beauty about the show. It's like, we get that access to these filmmakers, to these artists. I've worked with the biggest and brightest artists in the entertainment business, but learn about that journey, that creative journey, that collaboration to make the work that we see that's now on television or on YouTube. And, and before we jump, I just want to say, please follow us at architects pods. Uh, I can't wait for this. Sounds like a great series. Looking forward to it. It's called Art Architects with Karina Evans, Taj Critchlow, and Director X. And uh, I can't wait to hear some of these stories. Thank you so much, you guys. All right.